Hello, welcome. My name is Professor Jenny Bond, and today we are uh, introducing our great uh, Asian American Studies speaker, Dr. Stephen Anorosak, who is a visual anthropologist. He got his MA in Ethnomusicology at CSU Stanislav, his PhD in Ecology at UC Davis. He is known for his multiple plays, award-winning, uh, and films, excuse me, uh, uh, particularly his PBS films, Getting Loud, Next Generation Asian American Art, multiple award-winning, also part of the inaugural uh, Gates Millennial Scholars, Dr. Anwun Sak uh, served as the lead uh, cultural advisor and visual anthropologist for Walt Disney Animation Studios, Raya and the Last Dragon. Let's welcome Fresno State, our great Asian American Studies uh, speaker, Dr. Stephen Anasak. Thanks everyone, I appreciate the warm welcome. Um, now just take, you can take the, the, the speaker, so. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I just wanted to check to see if my screen share was um, it's working properly. Can everyone see that? Yes. Perfect. Yes. <laughs> so it's just a real quick run through of my journey. It's more just a story. So if you can just sit back, uh, take it for what you will, and then we'll get into you know a little bit more of the specifics um, a little bit later. But uh, just wanted to share that things that I've gone through, some of the lessons I've learned through the many mistakes that I've gone through, uh, learning experiences, but this is just part of my journey. Just think of it as a story. It's a refugee story. I was a refugee. Um, so professionally, I guess I'm in sort of the crossroads between cultural anthropology and digital media because we deal with how Southeast Asians are represented and we do that through the production of documentaries. We do that through the analysis of what visuals are seen uh, on screen. So part of that is creating some of that. So again, the journey. And the first thing that we look at is, you know, for many of your parents here, uh, saying I think a lot of the students here are pretty young and their parents are probably around our age now. And so your parents were likely refugees. That, came, that was me, that's my refugee picture um, in the Thai camps. So we escaped because of the turmoil that resulted from whether it be the secret war in Laos or the Vietnam bombings that occurred over Laos. For whatever the reason is, many of us left. Um, and then, so we'll talk a little bit about that story. Then a story of me as a student. I remember what it was like being in a class like this uh, Seng and I were in many of the same classes, uh, and we hung around the game room probably way too often. Um, but I remember the mindset of just trying to make it to the next, the next exam, pass the next exam, but not knowing whatever was on, you know, what would, whatever was beyond the horizon after graduation, because that's part of the stress and uncertainty, right? So talk about that experience, and then about what it's like on the other side. The responsibilities as, uh, you know, Professor Bond and I have, and, you know, that Seng has on the other side, the responsibilities that we have to our students. And we take that very seriously because you guys are us. 20, 30 years ago, like we see ourselves in you. You know, when we were growing up, there wasn't a lot of professors that looked like us. Very few. Ku Yang was one of them. Uh, the late, great Dr. Ku Yang. Uh, but there wasn't a lot. And you guys have a, you know, definitely more options to see reflections of yourselves. And I think that's a sign of progress. Um, so the refugee story. We were in the concentration, not the, not the concentration camps, the, the camps um, in Thailand. We fled Laos. That's my family there. Can anyone guess which one I am? Jenny, which one am I? The smallest. The smallest? You mean the cutest? I mean the cutest and the smallest. Yeah, I was this third guy right here in the red. Ooh. That's mom and dad. And we lived in a very cramped refugee camp situations as many of us did. Um, so we stayed there before we came to the United States and 
the next step was uh, we moved to um, to Hawaii. But the transition over, we only had five dollars to our existence. That's all the money we had in the world was five dollars. And I remember going. Uh, my mom telling us a story of when we made our first stop in Japan. My younger brother wanted. Um, he was thirsty. And he didn't want water, so we bought him some um, orange juice for like a dollar. So we spent twenty percent of our wealth on that drink and he didn't even like it he said it was too sour so it was kind of a waste so that's all we had that's all we came to this country with it was actually four dollars after that point and we lived in hawaii and that was life for us we didn't have much we didn't know that we were poor because everybody else that we lived with was poor so if everybody's poor then nobody's rich or poor you're just all the same um, and that's, that's, and this is a picture that I particularly love because it reminds us that our parents were young at one time. Uh, when you get, you know, a little bit older, like Jenny and Sang and myself, I'm not saying you guys are old. I'm just saying older. Um, but you know, our parents, um, they're getting on in their years and we forget that they were young and vibrant. And I want students here to kind of remember that, um, and this is how I see my mom, even though she's a lot older now, but in my heart and in my mind, uh, she's that strong, young, vibrant um, person that escaped war and that raised a family. So that's how I always see her to this day. Um, and this is another number that I remember quite vividly. So this is a number. Um, this was the money that we paid back to the US government, even though we didn't have to, it was the price for our plane ticket, our one-way plane ticket to the US. Now it wasn't mandatory that we paid back but my mom and my dad thought it was an important lesson, even though we didn't have this much money. So we worked in gardens, like just little community gardens. I remember digging up potatoes and I was always wondering why we'd have to go every weekend and dig this up and you know, we'd give it to somebody for a little bit of money. But to ask a refugee back in uh, the early 80s to pay back the flight, right? Um, you know, $1,250, that might as well have been a million dollars to us because it was such so, was so much money back then. But my parents thought it was really important to pay it back even though we didn't have to. So that taught me the lesson of being thankful and being responsible. So, you know, so have gratitude and think about this idea of responsibility even when no one's watching. That's an important lesson, I think. You know, this age of uh, always uh, posturing or saying what you're doing on social media, we didn't have this back then. So it's important that only you know, or it's important even if it's only you who knows the truth. Okay, so now being a student, um, we didn't have much, but I mean, there's things that we did have. We had a loving family. Um, we had our passions, which means things that we were interested in. I was, I was always interested in videos, uh, making little short movies or filming things. So whenever I traveled or you, you know, you'd see um, me with a camera, especially when I was in Laos or Thailand, and we'll get to that. But being a student, you know, what was that experience like? Well, um, we were poor. Um, and we really got a sense of this looking at the neighborhoods that we um, kind of grew up in, you know, and, this, and the friends that we had at school, we were kind of thinking, you know, um, like I didn't know what a pantry was. Like, you know, a lot of my friends who were, who are white that I grew up with, I went to their homes and they always had food. And they would open up this magical box inside their kitchen and you would see like a 7-Eleven in there. And you think to myself, oh my goodness, this is heaven. They would come home and snack like there was no tomorrow. But being poor was probably one of the greatest gifts 
that I had growing up because it, you know, it made you hungry. It made you want to strive. It made you want to do something. But so what is um, harder than being poor immigrants um, to a new country? Well, it's being a poor single parent in a new country because my dad passed away when I was really young. So now you have a strong female headed household. I don't know how many students here, you know, live in that situation, but you, you see that, you know, the mom has to be the, both the mom and the dad now, right? The person who provides the person who's loving, but tough. And so she had to do triple duty, right? Working, being a mom and being a dad and seeing the struggles that, you know, that you go through that left a big mark on me. Um, this is the kind of neighborhood that was right around the corner from me. So I grew up in South Modesto and this is ninth street. And, um, I go back and I drive through my old neighborhood from time to time. Um, and I don't know how many of you have seen neighborhoods like this. Um, but this is what I knew. Uh, I didn't, you know, I mean, I knew that there were nicer neighborhoods, but those weren't the neighborhoods that I saw. And so this is where I grew up. Um, but I always had my passions, uh, things that I was always gravitated towards, even though I didn't have the money for any of the equipment. I remember when I was making videos and using, uh, you know, there was no computers. So what I did was I took two, do you guys know what uh, VHS is? those big tapes that your parents, you know, you watch like the Thai Lacons and the Thai dramas, they would like, you know, have 40, 50 tapes. Uh, yeah. So I put two VCRs next to each other. I would hit play on one end and record on the other. And of course you'd never get it right. Cause there's always a lag. So every time there was an edit, you would see this blue screen when they cut to the next scene. So that's what I did to, um, you know, make little movies. And I remember like, you know, in the end credits where the, the names roll up, well, I used a, a tripod and I would print it out all the names and I would just move the tripod up to make it look like the page was scrolling. So it would just go slowly up and the names would look like they were coming down the page. I remember doing all these things in the first documentary that I had that got on PBS, uh, we recorded, um, all the narration inside a closet because we didn't have anywhere else. And you know how you guys uh, see these um, stars on TV where they're like recording in these nice studios and they have like something in front of them that looks like a screen or a popper. It, it stops the, like the popping sound with the, with the hard peas, right? It's like this nice little screen that they have circular. Well, we didn't have that. So what did we do? We took four chopsticks made a square, four chopsticks, and we put a napkin and we taped it together. And that was our popper. And it was just so gratifying uh, that that documentary made it on PBS. And just, we just did like MacGyver, just kind of put things together. And so that's a lesson to kind of think about, don't let the fact that you don't have things stop you. And that's where, my field site in Laos is, it's in Northern Laos in a town called Luang Prabang. Many of your um, parents probably know where it is. And my house is just right here. You see this white dot here? That's where I was born, little white dot. But this is where you can find me. If I'm ever missing in the world, I'm probably here getting a drink, a non-alcoholic beverage drink because I don't know how many people here are 18 and over. Right, Professor uh, Bon. I don't know that it's so non-alcoholic beverage. Yeah. <laughs> so I'll just have a drink, and this is what I'm looking at as far as my field side goes. But uh, but I love this place. This place where I was born, and and we'll revisit. Uh, just take a mental a snapshot of this because I'll come back to this. Just look at how beautiful this place is. So. 
what are some lessons I learned? Well, in the late 1990s, before you guys were probably born, uh, my friends and I started a magazine. It was the nation's first Lao American hybrid magazine in the country. And um, I was the editor. And I failed a lot because I was a young teenager starting a magazine that I didn't really understand how people work. So I would go to people and ask them, um, can you give me money for this magazine? What's the mistake in that? Well, it was a failure because I asked people what they could do for me. And that's the first mistake. It, because instead of saying, how can we be of service to the greater community and what can we do for you? I was asking them what they could do for me. So there was some wisdom in this. And the wisdom is to provide a greater good and to say, oh, how can we be of service instead of asking others to do things for us? So there's wisdom in failure. And don't be afraid to fail because as long as you find that wisdom, it's not a failure. So we transition now to life as a professor. Um, this is a proverb. This is, a, this is an old African proverb. It says he who learns, or it could even be she, right, Jenny? It's not he, it's she, he. Um, so, so those who learn, they teach because you're a model. When you learn, you're teaching others that, uh, that quest is important. So being a professor, now I'm on the other side and, you know, we feel a greater responsibility, but remember that scene in the neighborhoods? Well, this is my neighborhood now. This is my office. Seng's been here a few times, right, Seng? Yeah, I'm glad Seng's awake, actually, because I thought I was staring at an oil painting for, for a little while. I had, he had no, uh, he didn't even blink. He, it's his first blink, I think. But yeah, so this is, uh, you know, so we have a few more toys to play with, but the passion is still the same, right? With the camera, that was a couple hundred dollars, which is all we had back then too. Tools that are a little bit more sophisticated, but the principles are the same, okay? And now our life at the university, well, what are some things that I have learned as being a professor is that most of the challenges that students face is not because school's hard. That might be part of it, but the bigger issue is all of the stuff that's outside of school. Relationship issues, uh, expectations of parents, societal pressures, um, you know, cultural taxation, all of those things deal with their personal life. And I feel like that is uh, such a huge obstacle for our, um, for our students because of the expectations of their families. So much of the issues that I deal with are mostly like of a personal nature with students, not always because the exam was hard, okay? So if I were to say anything, I would say, if you have the chance, travel, change majors if you need to explore different things. Um, I started traveling um, when I was in college because that's where I had my part-time job. And I remember just using almost all my money to buy plane tickets. And whenever I bought that plane ticket, it was the most exciting feeling because now I have a date of something to look forward to rather than it just being sort of this endless summer of doing nothing in the Central Valley because I grew up in the Central Valley. So I went to Laos a lot, Laos and Thailand. But what was one of the things that I learned about being in the university that was really important? is that education doesn't always happen in the universities. In fact, education is often outside of the universities, beyond the walls, beyond these four walls. And I think when you start to realize that, you realize that everything that you do outside is just as equally as important as what you do inside the university. So the, to me, the true education is out there. It's going out there and learning. So what are some other lessons learned? Fast is slow. Whenever somebody approaches you and says, you know, I've got a shortcut. I've got a faster way of doing something. And something in your gut says, that doesn't sound right. You're going to likely end up doing it again. 
anything that's a shortcut that seems fast, you're going to end up doing it a lot slower because you're going to have to redo it again. So be very careful and mindful of going too fast or taking shortcuts. Okay. So then the flip side to that is slow is fast. That means if you're deliberate in your intentions, if you're thinking holistically, and if your pace is so that you get true learning out of it, then that's really the fastest way to do things because you're going to have to do that once in the right way because you're deliberate, you're thoughtful, okay? And I've learned this lesson over and over again about doing things in a way that's very thoughtful, okay? And be right with your intentions. So, It's a simple lesson, but it's to be thankful. Every day that you have air in your lungs is a day to, uh, is another opportunity to do things right. It's never too late to do the right thing. Uh, and it's to be thankful. I think, you know, one of the, probably one of the things that gives students most anxiety is reading the news. And that's true for us as a professors as well. Right, Professor Bond, I mean, like we read right before we go to bed and we're filling our heads with these crazy thoughts of the world. And this is true for everyone. So it's from a mental health perspective, um, you know, it's okay to be informed about the world, but don't flood yourself with things that may not be helpful to you because it's like trying to swallow the ocean. You know, you can't do it. To absorb the world's pain every night is going to take a toll on you. It's going to take a toll. So be thankful. Okay, and take things in bite-sized pieces, things that you can control. You know, we come, you know, from that picture that I showed you, you come from a pretty rough area, and I don't know what the, um, you know, where everyone has come from in this, but mo the, the thinking is that you are a, a product of your environment, right? You live in a rough neighborhood, so you're going to have a tough time succeeding. That's kind of the narrative, right? So it's your product of this environment. But what if you change the mindset and said, you know what? I'm going to be the solution to my environment. And to say, whatever challenges come on, it's just going to introduce me to my true self. A wall is there not to stop you. A wall is there to question you to see how bad you really want something. Okay, so think about being the solution to your environment rather than just being a product of it. Okay. And what is the best way to predict the future? For me, the best way to predict the future was to create it. And these are some of the projects that I've worked on. Um, and if you think about that for a second, you know, others can give you their version of reality and others can project on you. And a lot of what others tell you is not directly related to you. It's a projection of whatever things they've gone through. But for you to, you know, to think about what's ahead of you, there's really, really a one way to do it um, that'll hopefully bring you some satisfaction is to, to, uh, to create your own future. And for me, it was content creation and helping to um, share with broader audiences of Southeast Asian culture or Asian cultures at large and you know, give us some voice um, to what's out there. So the best way to predict the future is to create it. And that is uh, just a really quick rundown of my journey. Professor Bond, the floor is yours. Thank you, everyone. Let's give a hand. What an inspiring journey you've gone so far. So uh, 
Dr. Arun Sak, uh, would you like me to do, open the Q&A right now or would you do you have any further comments? I love a discussion, so let's just great to get straight to the Q&A and just give your students as much time as possible. All right, students, this is the time that we've discussed. <laughs> um, okay, so I think it's easier if you guys uh, just scream it out. What are your questions? And if you can't hear, I'll just repeat it. Um, you can ask questions. Some Somebody, uh, let's see. Um, Let's see, Anu, you monitor the chat. Everyone write questions in the chat and the live students, uh, you can ask me and then I'll just repeat your question. Yes, question? What was the process like working with Disney? Ah, the question was, what was the process like working with Disney? Good question. Um, uh, it's one of those things to where it's difficult to explain the scale of the things you're doing, right? Because, you know, when I operate, I'm usually on a, you know, on a, on a phone call or on like a Zoom call and I'm working in front of my, uh, you know, my laptop. And it's just like working in any, like any other sense. But then we, you know, I, I forget that whatever we're doing or whatever decisions we come up with is going to be enshrined in a film that's historic. Okay, and that's not something easy to wrap your mind around because most of the projects that, you know, that we're involved in sometimes, I remember being a student just writing, uh, you know, a paper for my professor. So two people are gonna read it and that's it. And then it, and it dies <laughs> in the ether of history. But now we're doing things that's gonna affect how young people are gonna view themselves. And I'm getting a better glimpse of that uh, after the release of the film, right? Because we kind of hold our breath until the film is released and now it's out in the open out for the whole world to see. So there's a little bit of uh, you know, uncertainty, uh, you know, intention around that until you know, it's like this baby's released to the world and you're kind of holding your breath, hoping that it's a positive impact. And you never know until, <laughs> until it's out there. You, you know, we could do all the focus groups and, you know, and have these little um, viewing sessions, but until, hundreds of millions or billions of people see it and give feedback um you never really know so it's um it's you know it's a lot of holding your breath and hoping you did the right thing um but i would say that the best experience um that i had was had a chance to take them to to laos remember that picture that i showed at the beginning of that of my field site that's where i took them so if you can imagine um you know taking the co-directors and the visual development people to that place in the world to show them the magic of your culture uh, and it's beyond the textbooks and that's what i mean about education being beyond the classroom experience like they would have been a they, they had a much different experience rather than you know them doing research and reading a book so ask any other questions uh we have a question from pim in the chat um, it's not a right question, but I want to ask, what's your favorite project so far that you've worked on? Gosh, you know, that's like asking, you know, which one of my children are my favorite? Um, saying, which one of your kids is your favorite? <laughs> uh, so, uh, you know, I would say the top three would be, uh, so Raya for its reach, right, to give Southeast Asians um, something to be proud of, you know, of themselves on screen uh, in, in such a, a storied and magical world as, as Disney. So the reach for Raya, um, next gen Asian American art was special in a way that we got a chance to look at many different types of Asians. In fact, uh, next gen Asian American art was a national PBS. And it was actually one of, it, uh, one of the, the artists uh, was uh, filmed in Del Rey, down in your neck of the woods down there. Does anybody know where Del Rey is? Yeah, uh, Nikiko Masamoto, um, Japanese American. So if we look at that, um, that was different in a way that we got a chance to look at art through all the different like Asian groups. We even had, um, we profiled Punjabis, Punjabis, uh, Kamai Americans and Japanese Americans. So that was special kind of in that, kind of intersection of art. 
and uh, and getting loud would be the, the the third one, and that was uh, because it was revolutionary. I got a chance to film over uh, ten years, going back and forth to Laos, and looking to see how the Lao American, I mean the Lao music and Lao film industry exploded. Because before, um, after nineteen seventy five, there was really no private music or film industry in Laos, and I was lucky enough to meet with. The, the young early pioneers so imagine like going back in time and getting a chance to meet jay-z and britney spears before they were famous and hanging out with them and having behind the scenes footage and then following through the journey when they really hit it big and now they're like famous all over the country and that's what that experience was like so yeah so those would be my top three next gen asian american art getting loud and uh, of course raya so Steve, a question that we're dying and, um, you know, we always talk about how the love language for Asians is food. Can yes. You think about those illustrations because they're just so beautiful and they mean so much about, can you talk about the food in Raya? So yeah, um, food is a huge part of the Southeast Asian, Southeast Asian experience. Y you know this because anybody that says hi to you, a common way to ask that is have you eaten? Right. First thing you do when you walk into like an Asian person house is come, come, come eat. Even though you've eaten 10 meals that day, you have to at least have one or two bites. Uh, so, yeah, food played a huge part. And, there's, you know, and it, I hope I'm not ruining the film in anywhere. There's no spoilers here. I'm going to try to do a kind of a spoiler free commentary. But the soups that we have um, that we talk about all the different ingredients, right, lemongrass, um, shrimp paste, like some of these are some, some ingredients, but the thing is that what makes it Southeast Asian is because it's a combination of sweet, spicy, salty, like all of these different combinations that you wouldn't think go together, make that such a unique dish. So we thought of that as sort of kind of, um, all the different groups, you know, stronger together, unified. Um, but that doesn't mean they're all the same. That's a different message. It doesn't mean that all cultures in Southeast Asia are the same. It just means that there's a, an importance and a uniqueness of when they come together. The other thing that we put into the film were fruits. If you took a closer look, there was a lot of fruits, durians in there, uh, rambutan, mangosteen, um, mangoes. So um, yeah, it could be no other place in Southeast Asia. And uh, Steve, can you look at the chat? There are several questions for you there. Ms. New, you can read them or um, the actual people who wrote the chat, you can, you can speak it or you can just read it. <laughs> sure. Here. Yeah, I'm going to, you guys are putting my reading skills to the test here. Uh, I'm, let's go back to the first one. I'll, I'll try to make it, uh, take them in the order that it was received, kind of like, um, you know, working the phone lines. Uh, Richard Chang, right, wrote, any new or potential projects in the near future? Richard, the answer is I can't talk about it. <laughs> but I'll just say you should keep your eyes open and uh, let's just strike a hopeful tone. That's all I can say. Um, uh, Adalberto says, uh, what was your favorite part about creating, uh, right? I think is working with a world-class team you know, many of the people that we worked at, um, you know, a couple of them had Oscars already. So our director, Don Hall, uh, he was the director of Big Hero 6, um, if you guys remember that movie. So it was just working with the creative people. And, you know, when we, when we uh, consulted and we gave feedback on certain things, it was just the fact that they were able to create it with such exquisite beauty. And there was really no limits to what they could do. It was, it was really amazing other than like a time limit where we had to make a decision, right? Because that the movie had to come out. So yeah, that was my, it's just like giving a drop of inspiration to them and they created this whole world around it. That was kind of amazing. Um, and then I think Hannah's next, right? Hannah says, how did Disney approach you about working on Raya? So this is one of the important lessons. Um, this is actually one of the big lessons for today is I had a body of work that was already out there and they reached out to one of my colleagues on the East Coast and she knew of my work a bit. And then, so she referred them to me. So a Disney product uh, project, you don't apply for. There's no application process. 
they don't put a call out and say, hey, you know, we need some Southeast Asian experts. They kind of go about it in a way where they look to see who has work out there and they start making these connections or they start asking around. So that's why it's important to have a body of work out there that you can be proud of. Not because you want to audition to be in some big movie, but it's because it's something that you love. And who cares if you don't work on a Disney film? And who cares if you don't work on a Netflix film? You had a great time living your life and you made your own mark. And uh, it doesn't matter if people, uh, it didn't even really, I mean, if they never approached me, I would still be doing the same thing. Um, so that's how I was approached is that uh, a friend and a colleague who knew of my work referred them to me and we started a discussion. Uh, Alexandria, what was the inspiration for Raya Prayer Ritual to Sisu? That was um, kind of partly based upon the water ceremony that we have in uh, Southeast Asia, where as we're saying a prayer to the dearly departed, we're pouring water. So if you go to a temple, sometimes they'll have a water ceremony. So like as they're chanting, they're pouring water into a chalice and a vessel. That's, uh, that's what it was based on. So it's kind of remembrance and a summoning of, uh, of the dearly departed. Shelby, uh, I see that Sisu was based off of Southeast Asian folklore. Could you go into detail about that? Yeah, so Sisu is based upon the Naga of the region. And the Naga is a water serpent. And the water serpent um, is a protector of like fertility, waterways. So it's a, it's a symbol of strength, fertility, life. Uh, Anu, did you have a question? Um, you can answer Andres first, if you want. Okay. Andres, okay. Um, could you go into detail about the creating the five lands of Kumandra? So the five lands of Kumandra, they, they do not represent a country. Like, it's not like Fang is Vietnam, or it's, it's not like that. So you got to uh, move away from equating one land to a specific group of people. Um, it's more like, what is their philosophy? So Fang is very angular and rigid, right? They follow the rules, are very militaristic, very uh, kind of clean lines and they're just very practical, right? And then you have other groups. Um, so if you think about it in a way, it's more like it barred a philosophy of each one of the cultures because there's people within each one of the cultures that have this mentality, okay? So it's not an equation of, a group is equal to a country. Okay, Andres, uh, Anu. Yeah. Since this is like the first Southeast Asian Disney movie, was there any like immense pressure on you to kind of like accurately depict us? Um, I think the pressure was always there. Um, and I think that's what caused me some sleepless nights is because, um, it wasn't a project that I talked a lot about when I was doing it. Um, saying like, you didn't realize that I was a part of it so much later, probably, right? Um, so a lot of it was under wraps because um, I couldn't talk about it. I was under an NDA, um, but yeah, so the pressure was there and that's why you know I made that comment. It's like, you don't know how it's gonna be received until the world sees it, right, I know. And so, Every time I went into a meeting uh, with Disney, I always took the community with me. Like I imagined all of my friends, all of my family, like my brother-in-law is Vietnamese, my sister-in-law is Thai, I'm Lao. A good number of my friends are Hmong. I grew up with Khmer people. Um, so it's like I had a UN of experiences with me and that, that I was responsible to because if I got something wrong, I mean, that's it. I could never live that down as long as I'm related to these people, <laughs> you know, that's, uh, you know, and then I have two young girls, like, how do I explain that to them? So, yeah, there was pressure because of all the, the um, cultural connections that I had. So, yeah, I just imagined them all and you all being with me in that room and making sure that, you know, while I was speaking to the producer or the creative people that I always saw you guys behind us. And, um, you know, I don't know if I got everything right, um, but I know that I worked really hard on it. And, and I just hope that some good can come from it, even if it wasn't perfect. Mm -hmm. 
So Jenny said, what's my favorite color, right? So Jenny, that's your question. <laughs> sure. <laughs> All right. Um, uh, was the past Southeast Asian wars and colonial history aware of racism? <laughs> Red sweats. Yeah, so the answer is yeah, some rep sweats for sure. Um, but something struck me is that people um, projected a lot of themselves when they saw this. And I'll give you an example, even in some ways that I didn't fully realize too. So some things took me by surprise. There was one comment from um, a Cambodian American that said that the last, again, hopefully I'm not ruining this. Jenny, can I, can I talk about what happens in the film? Have these folks they seen? They've all watched it, they've all watched it. Okay, okay, I just don't wanna ruin it. Okay, so the last part where there's a re, the reunification, right? People are going back to their lands. Boon is going back to his parents. Noi sees her mom, right? Tong uh, meets with his, you know, his clan again and his little baby. And he, does anybody know what, um, Tong's little baby's name is? Uh, do you guys know? Oh, they don't know. No, oh, I... that would be a great extra credit question. <laughs> and there's a hint in the credits. Um, well, I'll tell you anyways. Uh, his his uh, name is Tongler. Tongler. Yeah, it was never mentioned in the film. But if you look at like, the baby's names at the end of the credits, it's, it's in there. Anyways, that scene of reunification to this Cambodian American um, really made them emotional because it, it looked at the, like, the, re the re reunification of families after the Khmer Rouge and how families that were broken up got reunited. And I'd never, and I, you know, I didn't think of it that way. So when you ask me, like, you know, maybe how is this represented, you know, war, uh, colonialism, and just the turbulence, is that people will see these things. Um, and that one really touched me because of all of the heartache that surrounded um, the families being torn apart. And the, re and the reunification was a uh, really uh, important way to heal, I think. Because right? without that scene, it's kind of people are left wondering. Okay, so that that was kind of a special thing. Uh, Alexandria, uh, this is question number two from Alexandria, right? So does she get like twice the amount of extra credit points? Yes, she does. I wish. What was the inspiration for the large temples and buildings in the five lands? So they were from all over the different regions. So we had um, specific or some some specific architectural details from places like Angkor Wat. We had specific details from places from Indonesia, um, something called the Split Gateway, the Kandi Bentar. Um, so if you look at some of the places, there's a split, uh, split gateway is what they call it. And then of course the temples in Southeast Asia, right? So yeah, there were um, some inspirations that were drawn from um, Angkor Wat, the temples from uh, Cambodia, Laos, Thailand, Burma, and uh, and the really large temple in Indonesia, Borobudur, that was also in there uh, as an inspiration piece. Sean asks, what advice do you have for students who want to document their own communities and neighborhoods, both in terms of general approach and the use of technology? Uh, so I'm a big fan of uh, micromedia, and that just means don't let media be the big thing that's in, that you worry about. Um, when I first started, my camera cost a couple hundred dollars and we were able to get that on PBS. So it's not the equipment that you have, it's really the content of what you're trying to shoot. And I would say that the approach is to start building connections before you turn on the camera. You have to have connections with people before they trust you with the camera on. You can't just go barging into like, you know, a Chamel's house, for example. I'm going to pick on you, Chamel. It's like, you know, a stranger shows up in your house and they're going to ask you about the traumas of your refugee experience. You're going to say, I'm sorry. Um, I don't know you like that. <laughs> and that's how people are. You have to, you know, 
let Chabelle know that you're not a threat and that you're going to use this for good. And what interest do you have in her community? You know, how is this going to help her community? And so all of the things that are important happen before the cameras start rolling, Sean. So it, that takes time. You're going to need a key informant. You're going to need, you know, if you don't know the language, but you need to have a relationship and a, and a rapport with the people. So that, so that would be my advice is to start with the relationships uh, before you think about a camera and all that stuff. Because honestly, the best camera is the one that you have in front of you. And that's it. Uh, Adalberto, uh, what was the idea of making the people of the Five Lands clothing alike? So they had some similarities, but they definitely weren't all the same. If you look at it pretty closely, we made sure that the patterns were really different. The patterns had these motifs that were specifically designed for each group. Like Fang, for example, had patterns that were really angular and, uh, and rigid. Uh, heart had the shape of like water. Um, so anything that you saw in heart didn't have a lot of rigid lines and it was more like um, droplets of water. I have a live question from the live student audience. Yes. Oh, so my question was, where did you get the inspiration to start like so little with it? Right. So the question was, where did you get the uh, inspiration for the weather in uh, Raya? Oh, the weather. So, you know, much, uh, many of the visual development artists traveled throughout Southeast Asia. They went to Indonesia specifically Bali, Cambodia, uh, Laos. Um, so they knew that the weather was humid. So they were inspired by the fact that water takes many different forms. It can be clouds, it can be rain, it can be mist. Obviously it can be waterways, it can be waterfalls. So having been there, I think they were inspired by all the different ways that water uh, can exist in Southeast Asia. So that's probably, um, you know, my read on it is that they were there and that they saw it in all its different forms. Thank you. Any other live questions? Another live question. No, I was going to ask, are you talking about the clothes? What? The clothes? Oh, yes. Uh, another question was on the clothes. Was there any inspiration from any particular or was it a hodgepodge of Southeast Asia? The clothes are very distinctive for the different lands. Right. So if you know much about the clothing there, there's going to be certain um, clothing styles from mainland Southeast Asia versus like island Southeast Asia. Right? Island Southeast Asia would be like Indonesia, Malaysia, and the Philippines. So for mainland Southeast Asia, we wanted to make sure that we had silk and something called the sabai top, which covers the chest of, of, of men and women. Um, and then... Uh, we had sarongs in there and we made sure that for particularly the, the, the island groups is that there's a special type of clothing or a textile called batik, which uses like wax and dye. So the waxes kind of resist the dye, right? So they make their patterns with uh, like beeswax. Uh, and then the, once they put the dye on, the dye doesn't stick on those parts. So it creates patterns around it. So there's batik, there's silk, there's sabai tops, there's things that are like, um, like the specialized pants that looks like MC Hammer pants. Um, that's like one big wrap. And that's seen uh, in places like Cambodia, Laos, Thailand. Um, so yeah, so we made sure that we had a textile expert um, who was, uh, she runs USC's, I think it's the Asian American uh, Art Museum down there uh, for USC. So. In, in all of these different um, specialties, we had cultural experts um, that really helped us understand it to really minute and fine detail. So another uh, question live, Steve, is uh, the question of, uh, of, you know, as an anthropologist, you're very sensitive to Southeast Asian culture. Were there things that Disney wanted you to do such as little shoes or something? <laughs> Uh, or sandals with, 
items from the culture that are as a no-no? What were the cultural no-nos as an expert, as anthropologist, as so they don't offend that, that could have been, for instance, you know, some Asians, they don't like it when you touch their head or something, or for whatever reason. Um, what, can you talk about the cultural no-nos and yes-yeses that you were involved in? Sure. Um, how much time do you have? Do you have like another 10 hours to talk about that? Because that's probably how long that discussion will take. But I'll just... More hours. I'm seeing them. They, they want to be here. So, so um, I'll just say, you know, I'll go over maybe like the top uh, two or three. Uh, a huge one is head elevation. We made sure that when you have an older person in the room or somebody that is, or something that's majestic, like, like Sisu, right? The head, head elevation and eye line would always be respected. So for example, if you had Namari's mom, uh, there was a lot of scenes at the beginning before we changed it where Namari would stand over her mom as she's talking to her. And in Southeast Asian culture, you don't do that. Like if your mom is sitting down, you don't lean over her and start to tell her how unhappy you are with the way things are going, right? You do not leer over somebody like that. So we had to change that. We had to kind of um, take that into account. So that was one. So we changed a lot of those scenes. Um, another scene was where at the beginning where Raya comes out and she, and you know, when all the clans are invited, right? They stand in front of her and Chief Benja is, you know, saying, hey, welcome to Kamandra, blah, 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 and all this stuff. In the earlier versions, Raya was up there with him speaking from a position that was really high, that was really high above all these older chiefs of the village. And we thought that was inappropriate. So we cut a lot of those scenes out. So the only really scene that you see here is like walking down and getting Namari's hand, right? But she's much lower than everyone else. So that was, um, so head elevations one. The other big no-no is feet. Like you don't use your feet to grab anything. <laughs> You don't use your feet to um, to have the bottoms of your feet point towards anyone, right? It's it's because their feet are considered like the dirtiest part of the body. There was one scene I don't know if you remember Jenny where um, Raya and Sisu were captured and they were tied up, and this is the first time they met Tong. Like, right? So, right? They were on a boat and then Sisu runs up to the gate and then they get captured. And then Tong walks in. I don't know if you remember that part. Yes. So there's a part where she has to get her sword, right? Her sword is like laying far away. The original version of that scene has her feet kicking the sword and like bringing it towards her. And the foot would have touched uh, a sacred um, Chris, which was like the, Indi uh, the, the Indonesian wavy blade which you're not supposed to do with your feet and it had the image of the of the naga on it which feet aren't supposed to go towards so that was a huge no-no and we had to redo that scene to where now it's just further away and they're not using their feet to uh, touch it so head so head elevations big feet were huge um, making sure that all the feet gestures were respectful so that's just a small glimpse as to the no-nos and uh, things that we um, had to ask to get changed. Thank you. Okay. Um, have you applied your um, anthropology training to the film or the field work? I know, yes, absolutely. So this is one of those places where um, it's a really good conversation with for, for me and my students. It's like, how do, how do you translate everything that we talk about in class, about anthropology, the ethics of things, uh, speaking up, and um, you're making sure that your people are represented. And I can kind of guide you back to one of the stories. When I was first on the project, just a couple months in, um, we, had, we had just gotten back from Southeast Asia, Laos, and um, there was something that just didn't sit right with me with the film. It was just, uh, it really bothered me. And I was so new on the project, right? Um, it was the names of the characters. The names that you see now were not the original names. 
Um, and I wrote my strong, my, like my strongest note up to that point. And I remember really being hesitant to send it because if I came down this strongly on something that uh, was almost close to being done, right? Because you have to get the names on because then it goes into the script, right? And it just like rolls, like you need names for these characters. Um, and I remember I sent that note on my birthday and I told myself, you know what? If I get fired and let go from this project for speaking my piece, then I'm okay with it. Like I was ready to be let go a few months in. I sent it on my birthday and it's like, okay, good job. That's your birthday gift being fired on your first Disney project. Good job. Wow. So you're so amazingly strong. <laughs> um, any other questions at all? Oh, a live question. Yes. I think I got the question, Jenny. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, so, so you don't have to repeat it. I think the question was, when you went to Cambodia, did you just kind of look at the materials or did you bring them home, right? Yes. I mean, basically, was that, was that the question? Yes. Okay, so the answer to that was, uh, you know, we have um, a textile expert here. So we had many of the, all these um, textiles already here in the United States at the USC uh, Asian American Museum. So we already have live samples with us here. So they went there to get sort of the feel of life there, but we had many of the authentic samples already here that that we could draw inspiration from. I think you have some a lot of chat questions as well. <laughs> oh, sorry. I was <laughs> I'm here that I'm here. Um, let's see. Adalberto says, "What was the inspiration for the June and Raya?" So the June was really. Um, we we talked a lot about this. Uh, and the June didn't look like that at the beginning. It kind of looked more like um, skeletons. But then, you know, I think the directors thought that, you know, they had to go through uh, to a different direction. But really what the June was is all of the things that um, are representative of all of our bad sides, which is like discord, when you have hate, when you have self-doubt, when you don't trust each other. So what does that look like? Well, there's really no shape, right, of what that is. It's kind of this amorphous thing because that's a sum of all your fears, right? It could look like different things at one time. So it really didn't have a shape because it's like discord. It's like people not trusting each other. So it's more of an idea. So it's kind of abstract in some ways, but it changed over time. Uh, and then Alexandria, it's... Uh, this is probably her third or fourth question, Professor Bond. So just make sure she gets the appropriate uh, extra credit. Uh, what were the names before? I think of the characters, right? It's probably what you're referring to. Um, I don't know if I can reveal that, to be honest with you. Um, just know that it was very different and it did not sound Southeast Asian. And that's why I had an issue and many of us had an issue with it. Was there an inspiration for the name Raya or like um, from a person or folklore or something like that? Sure. That's a great question. So Raya, uh, it wasn't any one person. We went through so many names <laughs> for Raya. As you can imagine, that is your title feature introduction to the world, right? So you better get it right. Um, so Raya came from sort of, you know, what's a name that is important in the region and that has significant meaning to like both parts of the world. So there was a name that was brought up um, and it was, you know, a name that had significance in Malaysia and a name that had significance in Thai. So it kind of means like celebration. Um, 
and we thought that, you know, so it has to meet a whole bunch of criteria. So like right, whenever you choose a name for Disney, it's not simple. It was like, um, it has to, first of all, not be taken. We have to run it through copyright, making sure that it doesn't violate in any like big way. You know, it's not a swear or a cuss word somewhere, <laughs> right? It has to be relatively, um, you know, something that folks can say, right? Uh, and that's a debatable quality, but it has to go through all of these things. And it has to kind of work in the movie. So it's not as easy as just coming up with something that somebody's come up with. So it's what was not a simple process. Um, some of the other variations I think I can share for Raya uh, was like Kaya, but there, it didn't quite roll off the same way. We didn't know what that meant. We didn't just want to have something that didn't mean anything, especially as, you know, if it's the name of the main character. So that's a little bit of trivia for you. Uh, so am I just going down the list, Jenny, or do you have another question live? Uh, any live questions? Yes. The question was, what uh, fighting style did Raya use on what country? Right. Good question. So there's uh, martial arts played a huge role. And we wanted to make sure that the fighting styles kind of matched the, um, the personalities of the people that were using it, right? So, for example, it's basically Namari and Raya. Okay. So for Raya... She was based into the Filipino martial arts of Arnis and Kalis, where you're using like the double rattan escrima sticks, right? So that was her fighting style. Namari, on the other hand, was more hand-to-hand -hand combat, right? So now you have like Muay Thai. We're using all of your limbs and you're very physical. And if you guys go back to those fighting scenes, when was the last time you saw a Disney movie where somebody got hit with a closed fist <laughs> and those fightings right and 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 the fighting scenes were pretty intense remember the last scene with all those blades like my kids <laughs> were like i had to kind of grab them a little bit closer because they didn't realize it was going to be that intense uh, of a fighting scene so oh another bit of trivia for you that is not well known is that uh, Namari, the way that she is, right? Kind of kind of like dark and not trusting the world. Shamel, you remember this? The original version of Raya was actually Namari. Very dark, not really likable. So she had to sort of be changed. So like Namari was the first version of Raya. And that's worth the price of admission, Professor Bon. <laughs> Well, you're giving us all the secrets. So also, uh, Steve, you know, I noticed that controversially, but I, I believe it's a really great thing you all did. But I noticed that the Southeast Asians, uh, their skin per, per, um, had different, uh, you know, the huge issue in the, in the Asian American community is colorism, particularly, you know, lighter skinned Asians are more valued, quote unquote, even within families. But I noticed that your main characters were one could say dark skin. Now, was that intentional choice? Because it was very, you know, in your Southeast Asia, that can can be controversial, right? Yes. So the answer is a resounding Y E S. It was intentional. We had a lot of discussion around this about colorism, and we were very, very, very sensitive to it. And we made sure that you know the skin tones had a, a wide spectrum, and that not all of the people in power were light-skinned not all the good people were light-skinned not all the bad people were dark-skinned like yes it was very intentional and if you look at the crowd we made sure there was almost a 50 50 mixture of males to females like we had people look at that kind of stuff to make sure that we got that so yes it was very intentional that's so positive that the effect that you you created i mean just a subliminal effect that's wonderful bravo 
Any, uh, so we have our, our class is over in uh, six minutes at 315. Um, so I want to give my my live because um, they're leaving. So in six minutes, do you have any last minute questions? Oh, yes. Uh, the question live question is uh, from the audience is religions. Um, can you talk about was that in any way influential uh, actual Southeast Asian religions? So we, we, we kind of had to tread uh, carefully here because of the major religions in the region, right? So you have Theravada Buddhism, you have Hinduism in many of the mainland, I mean, many of, of the islands, right? You have Hinduism there on Indonesia. You also have Islam. Remember, Indonesia is the home to the largest population of Muslims in the world. Okay, so, and then we have Catholicism in the Philippines. So you're thinking, whoa, which do you go from and which do you choose? So we were really careful about that. Uh, I think there were some things that we wanted to root the audience in, and that was the spiritual nature of the region. And I'll give you an example. Um, things like animism, things like uh, spirit worship, if you look at the very first scene of Raya, do you guys, anybody remember what the very first shot was? Very first scene, first thing you see. Puppetry plays? What was it? She's riding the desert. It was right before the desert. The puppetry? No, no, so that was kind of like the prologue. Um, but, there, but there's the very first scene. Was it in the cave where, nope. no? That, that was when she ran already, right? She was running and then jumps in over on the rooftops. The very first thing you see in the movie, very first shot. Okay. Wasn't it a dragon? No. Some of the audience said they're talk when they're talking about Kumandra. So the very first, so the very first thing you see is a spirit house. If you go back and watch it, yes, very people miss it, and they and we hold that spirit house shot for a good a good number of seconds, five or six seconds. I know people missed it. Jenny, you're confused. We're talking about Ryan and the Last Dragon, 2021. <laughs> uh, yeah, it it was um, a spirit house. And that's where we wanted to ground people and say, hey, not a religion per se, but we're in a place that respects spirits. That is mind blowing. <laughs> wow. So um, class, we have three more minutes left. This is your last opportunity. <laughs> Take this opportunity with three minutes left for the live audience. Yes. How many times did uh, you watch Ryan? <laughs> That's a great question. Did you get that question? Yeah, I got it. And I don't want to answer it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, a lot. I think by the time the movie came out, you know, I saw obviously multiple iterations, but since the movie's been out, we have it on Disney Plus. People come over, uh, my kids watch it. Um, you know, whenever I go to his friend's house, they want the inside commentary um and you know, things like that uh and i don't mind talking about it because i think it's just a wonderful conversation piece it's like this uh it's like this olive branch that you can bring to people and say let's start a conversation may not be perfect but it's progress wow there's a lot of questions i did not get to shamel it's all your fault i can't read that fast there was one question in the chat that I would really love to get answered. It was from our wonderful Alexandria. Um, how did you decide that the main character would be female? Good question, Alexandria. Uh, oh, gosh. You know, that, that was not a decision that I had any part in. I think it was already part of the story when I got on board. And I think it was important that we had a female co-writer, Adele Lim. You guys know who Adele Lim is, right? She's a co-writer of Crazy Rich Asians. and um, Right. So um, 
See, Andres, the spirit house thing was real. See, I didn't make that up. I swear none of this is made up. It's true. Um, yeah, so it was always kind of known that we wanted to give a different spin on what a Disney princess is. And a Disney princess doesn't always have to be in the mold of the past. She can be complex. She can get upset. Um, she doesn't have to be perfect. But you know what? She's going to lead, you know, blaze her own path and she can come out victorious in her own way. And it doesn't have to be in the, you know, cast and stuck in the ways of, uh, you know, previous molds. And, and it's and it's a much different look at being a Disney princess. And I think that's ever been done before. Right, so I'm gonna call it at 3.15 if, if Dr. Steve Arnosak wants to stay around for any extra questions, but for my live class, thank you so much for coming. Let's give him a hand, everyone. All right, thank you so much, everyone. All right, and so this officially, I'm gonna close, I'm gonna turn off the, uh, the recording. I'm gonna do it now.